Get to Old Navy one day only tomorrow. Great gifts like blankets and slippers for the family are just five bucks, and Adora boots for women, girls, and toddler girls are just twelve bucks. Tomorrow only at Old Navy. Valid twelve fourteen. Select styles in stores only. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit Views, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leonard, and I'm your host. I'm a consultant to nonprofits, and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities, and you can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and Twitter. I encourage you to comment early and often using the hashtags Nonprofit U, Community Law Project, or When I Come. You can also leave comments on blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit you. The chat room is open and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you must open a listener only account. You can find a link to open the account on the episode page. And you can also email me questions at consulting at valeriefleonard.com or send messages through Facebook and Twitter. You'll find a Nonprofit You fan page on Facebook, and the Twitter account is at Nonprofit You. We'll be taking questions by phone and from our chat room at about the 30-minute mark. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 347-884-8121. Today's episode is what to do when ICE comes knocking at your door. We'll talk about I-9 audits, ICE raids, what to do if ICE wants to detain certain people in your work environment, how employers can prepare, employers' rights and responsibilities, what employers can do after an ICE action, and where to find additional resources. Again, we encourage you to call in with questions and participate in live chats at about the 30-minute mark. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Nonprofit professionals are especially encouraged to call in and share your stories and ask questions. Our guest for today is Jody Atler. Jody is the director of the Community Law Project for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I am going to let Jody come to you in her own way and introduce herself. So before she begins, I'd like to thank you, Jody, for being on Nonprofit You today. And again, it's an honor to have you. And we want you to tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you came to work with the Community Law Project. Sure. Well, thank you, Valerie. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in Nonprofit You. Um, so I am an attorney, and before I became an attorney, I was a community organizer in Edgewater and Uptown, and I was, as part of my job, I was helping tenants in buildings go to building court to complain about the conditions of their buildings. The idea was mm -hmm. to give the tenants a say so that not just the inspector and the owner were there, but the tenants could actually talk about the condition of the building. And I would sit in court while I took people down there, and I'd go, hmm, I think I could be much more powerful and more impactful if I went to law school. So I ended up going to law school. And after law school, worked for a couple of government agencies, but always wanted to go back to providing legal mm -hmm. services to nonprofit organizations. And a okay. job opened up at what was then called the Community Economic Development Law Project, which is now called the Community Law Project of the Chicago Lawyers Committee. And I applied for that job, mm -hmm. and I have been here for over 20 years now. Oh, wow. It doesn't yep. seem that long. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Amazing. <laughs> oh my. Okay. So on that vein, can you give us a little background on what the Community Law Project does? Sure. So the Community Law Project is part of a larger organization called the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And we are mm -hmm. civil rights lawyers and advocates working to secure racial equity and economic opportunity for all. We, rep we provide representation through partnerships with the private bar, and we collaborate with okay. grassroots organizations and other advocacy groups to implement community-based solutions that advance civil rights. 
The Chicago Lawyers Committee has several different projects. They have a, we have an eight hate crimes project, an educational equity project, a settlement wow. assistance project. We also have a voting rights and civic engagement project, and then we have the community law project, which is the project that I direct. The community law project works to provide free legal assistance to community-based organizations doing economic development work and social service work. We also represent community coalitions that are seeking a voice to provide current residents at risk of displacement because of development with a voice in what's happening in their communities. We also represent low and moderate income small businesses and first-time mm -hmm. homebuyers and social enterprises. We do all this by addressing their business legal needs. So we help organizations get 501c3 status, create bylaws, mm -hmm. review their bylaws, hire employees, address employee issues. We have attorneys who will represent organizations and small businesses in lease negotiations or contract negotiations. Mm -hmm. So basically, we address the legal business needs of our clients so they can focus okay. on their missions and growing their businesses without worrying about the legal details. In addition to actual legal representation, our attorneys provide education to our clients. We have neighborhood legal clinics for small businesses where a business doesn't have to come downtown but can meet with an attorney in the community to have their mm -hmm. legal questions answered. Once a month, we have an employer hotline so that we have attorneys who are available for 30-minute free phone calls from mm -hmm. employers to address their employment questions. We have business legal alerts and pretty much try to serve whatever business legal needs community-based nonprofits and entrepreneurs might have. Wow, you guys have really grown over the years. That, that, that's a lot of stuff. Right? Yes, yeah, we are doing a lot. <laughs> You're definitely to be commended, and, and I can honestly say that you do a lot and you do it well. You know, I Thank you. I am yeah. I'm a consultant and I've worked with a, a number of clients and one of which, you know, really, really benefited significantly from your services. You know, there was a serious compliance issue and you know, I, I always like to tell the story whenever I have somebody from the law project on because I think people need to know that you guys are very accessible, you have access to some of the greatest attorneys in the city, and your staff is definitely you know, right up there with the other attorneys that you, from time to time, work with. But we had an issue with compliance in which the uh, client had not filed their Form 990s, and I know that's not why we're here today, right. but you know, I just want to <laughs> let, <folks, laughs> let folks know. But there was a problem with the 990s. This client had not filed in three years, and they were in danger of losing their tax-exempt status. And right. we worked with the, the law project and another one of their partner attorneys who happens to be a tax attorney from a very high-powered agency, and we worked with them and an accountant. And needless to say, um, a, a bill that could have put them out of business, we were able to get abated. So I am forever, forever grateful to the law project, not only for what you've done, you know, with this particular client, but you know, helping me with with stuff that that I have to deal with, and I'm I'm not even I'm not going to go into that. That's not <laughs> why we're here. <laughs> yeah, well, well, actually, so, thank you, and I I will say that we have a pretty small staff, but we have about mm -hmm. 300 attorneys across the city who volunteer with us on a regular basis. And so we have relationships with almost all of the large law firms in the city and some of the smaller firms and, and solo practitioners. So that's how we're able to do as much work as we do. Okay. We are able to tap that's into awesome. this big network of attorneys. Yes, and then some of that work, now, <laughs> now that I'm getting us back to why we're here, some of that work deals with employment issues, and we're here today to talk about what, you can do if ICE comes knocking on your door. So we're living in an era in which immigration laws are being aggressively enforced. So, Jody, can you give us, you know, a frame of the issue, a brief overview of the immigration landscape and some of the main issues that we as citizens or we as people in the workplace, you know, might you know, find ourselves you know, we we sure. think of this as somebody else's issue, but it's really everybody's issue. 
Right, and that's exactly what I was going to say. You have to kind of have been living under a rock in the United States to not know that there is a newfound attention on immigration issues in the country. Um, you know, it seems to me almost every single day there's something happening. The since the election, I think that most a lot of people living in this country, regardless of what what your political party is, are aware of the fact that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a U.S. citizen and you have relatives that live in other countries, they may be prohibited from coming here based on an executive order. Or if you are a legal resident or here on a temporary visa and you travel abroad, you might not be able to get back. Um, children who were bought, brought here as young children and have lived here for years but are not become legal residents may have some issues. It just seems that there are daily government pronouncements and I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but that's what it feels like. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about, you know, who can work here, who can live here, who can visit here. And, you know, there are, there have been executive orders that have clearly indicated that employers are going to be on some level the first line of defense for a lot of this. There are issues about mm -hmm. visa site visits, more wage and hour audits, I-9 audits. They are, the Immigration Service has said they're going to be hiring 10,000 new agents. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, just two weeks ago, the acting director of ICE reiterated the mission to promote homeland security and public safety through criminal and civil enforcement of existing laws and further pledged to increase ICE time spent in workplace audits four to five fold. Wow. Wow. Um, they're taking, wow. Yes, exactly. They're taking very seriously this concern that American jobs are a magnet for illegal immigration, this is language that has employers concerned across the country. And for some people, they may also feel that this is language that's somewhat circumspect, but we're not going to debate that. I think that it's mm -hmm. safe to say that, you know, there are immigrants in this country legally or not legally that are working in the United States. The Small Business Immigration Coalition in Illinois says roughly 80% of seasonal agricultural workers are immigrants, but they also mm -hmm. say that when some of these employers try to put out a plea to hire young Americans, they're not doing the work. The associate, mm -hmm. in addition to agricultural areas, we know that the associate, Associated General Contractors of America, say construction firms can't find workers, and that's why they're yeah. hiring people coming to this country from other countries. So there's a mm -hmm. huge problem, and I think that everybody agrees there has to be a solution to this problem. I think that there are some people who also feel that right now what's happening is that there is just fear kind of being imposed on a lot of people, right, and right. I think they are both employers, employees, family members, friends, you know, who are just literally uncertain about what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So when we look at Form I-9, that's the form that's used for verifying the identi identity and employment authorization of individuals who are hired. So all of us have to fill that form out, right, anywhere in the United States. But from time to time, ICE, and when we talk about ICE, we're talking about the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, they'll conduct an I-9 audit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I think I had a, a Freudian slip. I won't tell you what other word I was thinking, but <laughs> audit. They'll do an <laughs> I-9 <laughs> audit. Right. So why would they do that? Okay, so a, a lot of times what is happening is that because there's an executive order from President Trump that directs <laughs> Departments of Labor, Homeland Security, the Justice Department, Social Security, to review employment based on foreign worker programs and directives mm -hmm. to remove people who are out of status unlawfully. The I-9 audit is a paper audit, so it's less mm -hmm. um, personnel intensive for ICE. It is okay. also considered something that is sometimes used as an introduction to doing a raid. The, okay. um, the form itself is fraught with a lot of difficulties. Um, I-9 reviews have shown that there are over 80 different ways to mess up the form itself, and there's a 55% wow. error rate. Wow. Yeah. That's um, Google form? Yep. Wow. Yep. And I don't 
Um, yeah, that's just like voter registration. Yeah, and the one thing that people should understand that are listening in, this form is something that has to be completed by every single employer once they accept a job. I'm sorry, every single employee and employer once they accept a job. And the employee mm -hmm. has to provide two forms of government-issued identification that the employer has to review and determine whether they're genuine or not. So what the government has done mm -hmm. is really put a burden, a burden on the employers to wow. verify whether people are eligible to work in this country or not. And if you mess up, and we'll talk more about this, there are potentially criminal and civil sanctions that can mm -hmm. be imposed. The I-9, real quickly, is, um, you know, the employee fills out part of it. The employer fills out the other. They have to be kept for three years after somebody is hired mm -hmm. or one mm -hmm. year after the last day they worked, whichever is later. And they're only filled okay. out one unless there's a legal reason to fill them out again. So an I-9 audit may be the result of an employee or employee the, the, that Homeland Security, which is the department that ICE is, the agency is part of, determines that there may be employees who are working that don't have proper legal authorization. They may be tipped mm -hmm. off to that by another government agency who has noticed the discrepancy in a name or a social security number. Um, an mm -hmm. individual may have been charged with identity theft and be identified as working there. Sometimes oh, wow. what happens is an employee gets arrested and has a, has a company ID on them. And they determine that that employee is not eligible to be working. So they'll, they'll contact ICE and say, you may want to take a look at this company. Sometimes mm -hmm. they get, you know, sometimes it's an employee who is actually reviewing um, the I-9 forms and is told mm -hmm. by the employer to not worry too much about what the documentation is that's been provided. And so that employee is concerned about their own personal liability. So they may become you know, you might call it a whistleblower, or you might call it a confidential informant, and they may turn mm -hmm. turn in the thing. So there's a number of reasons that this could end up happening to a, to a business. Oh, my goodness. This is much more complex than I ever dreamed. But I'm thinking, you know, one thing, check, two things, check, but it, it could be a number of different things. Right. None right. of which I thought about. <laughs> Yeah, I think it has to, it has to do with the it does seem like a simple form and I think that's part of the problem. I think part of the mm -hmm. issue comes in if if it's not fully completed, that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. If the employee and the employer don't like fully complete both sections. So there's a number of reasons. Sometimes you use an out of dated form, which also can be an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So there are unfortunately there are a number of issues that come up with it. That's amazing. So I want to remind our listening audience that you're listening to Nonprofit You. We're speaking with Jody Atler, the director of the Community Law Project for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. We'll be taking questions from our listening audience and the chat room in about the 30-minute mark, so that's in about 15 minutes. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 347-884-8121. So I, I think you touched on this a little bit, um, Jody, but can you tell us what an I-9 audit entails? Sure. What an I-9 audit entails is a, it's a, again, it's an administrative paperwork investigation, and you will receive a notice of inspection from the from ICE or the Department of Homeland Security, and they will okay. give the employer three business days to produce the I-9 forms. And then the employer may also be asked to provide documentation like a copy of the payroll, list of current employees, the organization's articles of incorporation or business licenses. The mm -hmm. agents will then conduct an inspection of the forms to determine whether there's compliance or not. If there are technical or procedural violations found, the employer has 10 business days to make corrections. Employers that have been determined to knowingly hire and continue to employ unauthorized workers will be required to cease the unlawful activity and may be fined. 
and in some circumstances criminally prosecuted. I think the process wow. is that you get this notice of inspection, you turn over the I-9 forms, and they ask to see the originals, and then they give those back to you. They will then issue one of several different responses. They will issue either what is called a notice of inspection results, and that's a mm -hmm. compliance letter. That's what you want. You want a notice of inspection results because that means they found your business to be or your nonprofit to be in compliance. They may okay. issue a notice of suspect documents. What that means is that based on a review of the forms, they've determined that there is an employee who is unauthorized to work. And they tell the employer then that there may be possible criminal or civil penalties for continuing to employ that person. But they also mm -hmm. allow the employer or an employee an opportunity to present additional documentation to support the fact that they're able to work, to demonstrate that they're authorized to work in this country. Okay. Another option, another option is a notice of discrepancies. And what that is, it's very similar to a notice of suspect documents, but it really has to do with um, they're unable to determine whether somebody's eligible or not. Maybe some people might consider this more of a fishing expedition than identifying mm -hmm. a particular employee. But even then, the employee, the employer needs to let the employee know and give them a copy of the notice and have the employee have an opportunity to give ICE additional documentation. Mm -hmm. A notice of technical or procedural failures means that you have 10 days to correct those. And that, again, is like you either have like missing information on the I-9 or it may be on the mm -hmm. wrong form, or there may be kind of a signature that doesn't, you know, there may be something like, you know, they can't read a signature on the form, something of that nature, and mm -hmm. you have 10 days mm -hmm. to correct that. If it's not corrected, however, there can be substantial vi substantive violations. A warning notice basically says, we gave you the opportunity to fix these things, you're not fixing them, and there may be a monetary penalty if you don't comply. There's also a notice of intent to fine, and that basically says there were uncorrected substantive technical issues where you're knowingly hiring and continuing to violate the law, and you have mm -hmm. then either the opportunity to negotiate a settlement with ICE or request a hearing with, the, with, the, with an administrative officer. The thing that people should take away from this is twofold. One is that you are often given the opportunity to correct errors. But if you don't correct them, then there's a potential for monetary penalties and criminal penalties. Mm -hmm. And the monetary penalties can go as high as 16000 per violation. Usually wow. that's going to be if you're really a bad player, right? That's going to be they've mm -hmm. been out before, they've talked to you about this, you're continuing to do this, and at some point, you know, they may come and, and basically close down your business. And if you get this also and they don't close your business, they may restrict you from ever entering into a federal contract again. Wow. Wow. Those so it's are pretty, pretty, pretty stiff. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, oh, my goodness. So, so how can employers actually prepare for the audit? You know, it, it seems like it's something that might sneak up on you, but it does sound like you might be able to read some of the signs or be proactive. Right. right. So, so the, the best thing that employers can do, and again, this is whether you're a nonprofit employer or whether you're a small business employer, is do a self-audit before you get a notice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is recommended is for, there are a couple of things that are recommended. One is that you keep all your I-9s together. Don't put them mm -hmm. in personnel files. Keep them together with the current employees separated from the former employees. And part of the reason you want to do that is because if you get a notice, you do not have to go pull things out of everybody's personnel file. And you also mm -hmm. want to make sure that you don't open the door to letting ICE look at your personnel file. So if you keep these separate, that's a, that really helps. And if you consider mm -hmm. doing a self-audit, there's a lot of information online that you can find about how you should go about doing this. Obviously, because mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer, I will tell you the first thing you should do is find a lawyer to help you um, who knows what this <laughs> right? is. If you don't, and if you don't feel like that's necessary, what I would suggest is there's a Department of Justice 
um, document about what you want to do if you're going to do a self audit that's pretty helpful. And what they talk about mm -hmm. is making sure that you're not just auditing one employee versus another. You don't want to look okay. like you're discriminating against one employee versus another. So you want the employees to know that you're doing this self-audit and the reason you're doing it and that it's not in response to a government subpoena or notice of request. If a deficiency mm -hmm. is found, you have to be very careful about how changes are made to the I-9. And the bottom line is that if there is a deficiency found in the first section of this form, only the employee can make a change there. If it's in the okay. second or third section, the employer can make a change. But you should never use whiteout. You should, you should never erase anything. The best way mm -hmm. to make a change is to have that employee, if it's the first section, cross it out mm -hmm. and then draw a line through it and either enter the correct information or omitted information and then initial and date that. And then okay. also do a memo that's attached to the I-9 that explains that you did a self-audit, you identified this problem, and you corrected it. The presumption mm -hmm. is that the employer has done what they're supposed to do and the employee is authorized to work in the country. So what you're doing really is you're self-auditing yourself and going, oops, we forgot to fill in this part. We better fill this in now. But we want ICE to know that we're filling it in later. We don't want it to mm -hmm. look like we pretended we had this all done to begin with. Um, right. So that's like the best thing that uh, that an organization can do, up of, up in front, and they you know have an audit memo attached to the corrected I nine explaining what the reason for the changes are, the date the correction mm -hmm. was made, and the fact that it was made during a self audit before any notice of inspection was received. You never destroy the old I nine if the employee is mm -hmm. still working there. Um, but but that's the best thing to do, and the idea really behind this is that you want to get in front of the issue. Right. You want to, you want to make sure that if ICE comes, you've already identified what the problems are, and you've taken steps to address those problems. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so that tells us what to do before they get there. So what happens if they show up on your door? Unannounced. Hopefully, you will have put some systems in place like what you recommended. But what happens when they're on premises? What are some of the things you can do? Well, the first thing you always want to do if they're on your premises is to call your lawyer. Um, I know mm -hmm. that a lot of nonprofits that we work with don't necessarily have a lawyer who they can call. Um, but I mm -hmm. would say this is one area where you might want to again get in front of the situation and try to identify whether it's somebody on your board or whether it is, you know, somebody who has a friend who works in this area or one of the other legal services area organizations like mine or the Community Activism Law Alliance, just to know that there's someone you can call if this happens. Um, it's mm -hmm. rare that ICE can show up for an I-9 audit without notice because, again, by law, they're required to give you at least three days' notice before they come okay. to inspect the I-9. Um, but if they do show up, you know, obviously it's always kind of, and even if they have, even if you have the notice, you want to let your employees know when they're going to be there. You want mm -hmm. to make sure that you have a location where they're going to be reviewing those documents that isn't open to the public or even to the employees or your clients. Mm -hmm. What you want to make sure, you know, you want to make sure that it's kind of a controlled situation and that you mm -hmm. are the one who's controlling it, not them. Okay. So, one in other words, things, you don't want to... Okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, you, said, you don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, all the disadvantages of not being in the same room, seeing each other right. talk. Go ahead, Jody. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I just, right. You 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 want you want to be able to control as much of the situation as you possibly can. And one of the ways we mm -hmm. suggest you do that is, and this is whether it's a raid or an I nine audit. You want to make sure that there are people identified employees who are allowed to talk to them. Not every employee. I got gotcha. you. You want to have one person and one backup person who understands what's going on and has understands the process, knows who to call mm -hmm. when they show up, um, and is responsible for kind of exercising as much as much control as they possibly can. 
I gotcha. Yeah, so so basically I was just going to make a comment. It just sounds, and I think you confirmed it with your prior comment, you just don't want to give them free reign of the premises of, of your, yes. your, your place of work. Right, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So uh, assuming that there could be problems that – turn up during this process, what might some of those problems be? And I know you touched on it. Sure. So, again, it's, some of the problems are that the forms are not completed correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said earlier, there's over a 50% error rate on these forms. Wow. Sometimes it's oh, the cool. wrong form. Yeah. Sometimes it's the wrong form is being used. Like everything mm-hmm. else um, in the government, you know, you have to make sure that the form you're using is the most current version of that form. So mm-hmm. if you are hiring people now and you're having the I-9 completed, you must be using the form with the date of July 17th, 2017 on it, rather than mm-hmm. earlier forms. Um, wow. You, yeah, and people don't know that, right? I mean, why would somebody necessarily yeah. know, particularly if you're working in a small grassroots, you know, community-based organization? that the forms have changed. Um, so mm-hmm. this is your heads up if you're listening to before you fill out the form, go on the internal, go on the website and make sure that you're using the most current forms. Um, that suspect documentation was used to verify work authorization. That, you know, you the Social Security card that you're looking at may have looked like it was tampered with. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes you forget to do an I-9. I know that you know, I know that there are some business owners who I've talked to and I've mentioned I-9. They don't even know that they're supposed to be doing it. Um, mm-hmm. we're, 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 you and I are both in the business of making sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> right, right. So we are, you know, part of the reason we're doing this is to make sure that every employer knows that if you have an employee, they have to have an I-9 completed. It does not apply to independent contractors, in case anybody was wondering about mm-hmm. that. It just applies to every employee. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so those are some of the potential problems that can turn up. I think that one of the issues also that may happen is if the, if the investigation determines that there are a lot of problems with the I-9, again, it may lead Mm -hmm. to a raid because they may feel that the employer is not properly seeking verification of work status, Mm -hmm. which may then kind of open the door or be a red flag that there are other problems going on or that there are people working in the business or the nonprofit that are not authorized to work in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So along those same lines, what are some of the things that people can do to correct the deficiencies? I'm assuming that if they fail an audit, the government is going to give them a letter with a list of things that are wrong and give them timelines to make corrections. Is that how that works? Yeah. So this is, you'll, we'll go back to, this is when you'll get that notice of discrepancy or notice of suspected oh, I got you. Suspect right, right, right. document. So you will get mm-hmm. that and you'll have time to correct those things. Um, mm-hmm. And if you don't correct those things, then you'll, you'll, you'll look at potentially getting, you know, a notice of fine um, which is what you don't want to have happen. Okay. A determination. So it sounds you know, like. So a, go ahead. Yeah, it sounds like it's a progressive discipline, for for lack of a better description. You know, each time you get a notification, the the stakes get higher for what the consequences could be for for not complying. That's what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. I think that's absolutely correct. All righty. I wanted to remind our listening audience that you're listening to Nonprofit U, and we're speaking with Jody Atler, the director of the Community Law Project for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. We will be taking questions very soon. Um, we're into the half hour mark. The call in number is 347 884 8121. And I also wanted to take a moment just to let folks know that they can strengthen their organization's Giving Tuesdays efforts by by participating in Webinar Mondays. 
I'm sorry, Webinar Wednesdays. And what Webinar Wednesdays are is a set of webinars that will help people to put systems in place beyond, you know, just a, a series of, you know, marketing messages on social media. You know, after the dust settles, you still have to make sure you're in compliance. You still have to make sure your board is helping you out and all that good stuff. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, I'm going to be doing webinar Wednesday to start at October 25th, and I'll be going through December 6th. So if you want to know more, send me an email at consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com. Okay, so Jody, before we um, start back our conversation, I just want to check the chat room and see if we have questions. And I do. I see two questions. Um, the the first question is, how long does a typical audit take? And I, my gut tells me it may not be a typical such thing as a typical <laughs> audit. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's correct because it really is going to depend on the number of employees mm -hmm. that an or, that an organization or a business has, and it it it's up it's up for grabs. I mean, it's just is going to depend on how 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 much they're going to scrutinize your documents and how many mm -hmm. employees you have. So I, I can't really give you a, a specific framework. I mean, we, we know that you get three days once you get the notice. You get wow. 10 days to do the corrections. But other than that, it's really hard to, to gauge, you know, when you're going to get that final final decision by ICE. Mm hmm Okay, so what this sounds like to me is this is not a process that the government is interested in dragging out either. You know, we're looking at days and not months, mm -hmm. you know, to respond. So it sounds like they're looking for you to respond quickly. I think that's correct. I also I also will say, and I, I meant to say this earlier, and I don't think I did, I, you know, the, I don't think that we're going to see this happening to a lot of nonprofit organizations. I think they okay. have bigger fish to fry unless they really have some reason to suspect that a nonprofit is not in compliance. And when I say not in compliance, they have some reason to believe they're either not doing their I-9 or they have people who are working for their nonprofit that do not have proper work documents. I got you. That, that's good to know. Okay, and then the second question I see, um, businesses been known to be shut down because of these immigration issues. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I have not mm -hmm. heard recently of a business being shut down because of I-9 noncompliance. Okay. But it could, it could happen. I mean, if it was, again, if it's a repeated issue of noncompliance, after receiving warnings, they certainly mm -hmm. can shut down the business. I mean, basically, you could find yourself having to let go of your whoever you are employing that doesn't have the proper authorization to work, mm -hmm. and you know, potentially losing business, losing federal contracts. So it could certainly happen. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I look at the fines. Did you say fifteen thousand dollars per? For employees yeah. that, that doesn't comply, it, it, it can be, but they really do look at again. That's that's not going to happen the first time there's a non-compliance issue. I that's, guess that's, okay. There's a there's a scale, and the scale just goes higher and higher. Um, I guess so. You. It's really something that's going to happen if you, for lack of a better term, kind of are a bad player I, and are okay. not correcting cor not correcting things that need to be corrected. Okay. So when we look at a raid, you know, so on what grounds might an ICE raid, might ICE raid um, a business or a nonprofit organization? Right, right. So, so a raid is very, very different than an I-9 mm -hmm. audit. And a raid is generally the result of ICE collecting evidence using traditional criminal investigation techniques. So they have been you. watching your business. They have been maybe interviewing people. They have been gathering data from other government agencies, such as Social Security Administration, Department of Labor, Wage and Hour, the Office of the Inspector General. And they're collecting, or again, through an I-9 audit. And 
the investigations have given them reason to believe that there is an employee or employees working for the company mm-hmm. or the nonprofit that do not have proper authorization to work. Um, the raids frequently result from, again, somebody who's disgruntled who is maybe a high-level employee and is uncomfortable with the way things with the way the business is proceeding with respect to I-9. It may be Mm -hmm. um, another federal agency that alerts ICE to the issue. Um, Okay. They may be investigating someone because there appears that there's identity theft or something like that. But that's, that's frequently how the raid begins. It's, it's, it's not the first thing they do. It's the result of an investigation Mm -hmm. that's been ongoing. I got you. So you already told us what you can do, you know, once ICE comes on premises, you know, just to do a document audit, right? Um, Are the same procedures in force for a raid, or would you do something slightly different, or are you more restricted once they're doing a raid? Yeah, so I think this is is actually quite different in my mind, because if there's Mm -hmm. going to be a raid, they have to have a subpoena. And okay. so that, that they can't just come to your work, your place of work and come in and start arresting people. Well, they can't, but legally they can't. Um, mm-hmm. they, have to have, they have to have a judicial subpoena. And what that means is they have to have taken all this investigation, investigative information they've collected and gone to court, either a state court mm-hmm. or a federal court, and presented it to the court, and the court has to issue a subpoena. So the first thing that happens If there is a raid, ICE will come to your place of business, and they may um, Mm -hmm. circle it. They may make sure that they're at every exit. They may wait out in the parking lot. But as the employer, you are entitled to go and ask them, number one, what they're doing, what they want, and if to see the subpoena. Mm -hmm. If they show you a subpoena, it has to be dated signed by a judge or and it should have either the US district court or the state court on it. So you make sure it's mm-hmm. a valid subpoena. If it's signed by somebody from ICE, it's not a valid subpoena. And they oh, can wow. if, they, if they don't have a valid subpoena and this is if they don't have a valid subpoena, they can't enter the private areas of your business. Okay. If they're on a park, they can be in a parking lot, they can be in a lobby or reception area, but they can't enter a private area of your business. This is, again, why it's really important to have one or two staff people, well, usually two, one person and a backup, who know these rules mm-hmm. so that they're the people who, if somebody, if somebody from the government shows up, they're the people who are talking to them. They know okay. how to look at a warrant to determine if it's a proper warrant or not. They, you know, they know if it's not a warrant, they know how to politely say, I'm sorry, but you can't enter the premises. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you know, you, the, a visit can be really disruptive, but you want to make sure that if they, if ICE officials come or officers come, that you've got someone on staff, whether it's your executive director, whether it's, you know, if you are lucky enough to have HR people, whether it's your HR people who know what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do and know to look okay. at a warrant or not. So. Okay, great. I have another question from the chat room. Uh, we have a question from Tamika Flowers, and her question is, if the employer is using E-Verify, is that enough to avoid audit issues? Actually, it's interesting because sometimes they'll, they will, if you have I-9 problems, ICE will suggest you use E-Verify, and mm-hmm. it should be enough. My understanding is that as good as E-Verify is supposed to be, it's not foolproof. So it mm-hmm. is a benefit, but it's not a requirement. There is some speculation also that E-Verify is going to become mandatory, it's not right now. Okay. Um, and for those people who don't know what E-Verify is, um, if I can find my notes, I'll tell you what it is. Okay. 
but it's a computerized system um, that is intended to be used by employers to confirm not just regular documented workers, but to confirm people who mm -hmm. are working on different different work visas. I I got. It. So it's a database that can be searched, and you can verify information. It sounds like. Right, but like all so data is only, only as good as the information that's put into it. Okay, I got gotcha. you. So in a perfect world, yes, it should be enough, but in actuality, as you said, the data that goes in is only as good as the, the people right. entering it. Or at the time, it doesn't mean that they're bad people. We all make mistakes and Mm -hmm. You already described. <laughs> you already described the fact that there are a number of factors that can impact the accuracy, and has, and none of those factors you indicated has anything to do with dishonesty, which I thought was right. interesting. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, what happens if ICE wants to detain someone, you know, while they're in the workplace? Right. Well, unfortunately. If they have a warrant and they have reasonable suspicion that an individual is not authorized to work in this country, they can do that. Wow. Um, yeah. There are, it, it's very unfortunate, but it's true. I think that um, they tend to show, so ICE tends to show up for a raid with no warning, right? No announcement. It's not like you get mm -hmm. the notice that you can get to the I-9. Um, and if they want to detain people and they have a warrant, they can ask for proof of authorized, authorized, I'm sorry, authorized status to work in this country if they have a reasonable suspicion that the person is working illegally. Now, this mm -hmm. reasonable suspicion, we could spend days discussing what that means. Um, mm -hmm. But basically what an employer needs to do, un unfortunately, is kind of, advise their employees that they have the right to remain silent but not tell okay. the employee they don't have to answer questions. So there's a, there's a kind of subtle distinction between that. So as the mm -hmm. employer, you don't want to tell somebody not to speak, but you want to make sure they know mm -hmm. they have the right not to speak. And that's true whether you're a documented worker or not a documented worker. Mm -hmm. They can arrest someone if they have reasonable cause to believe that they're present in the U.S. illegally and is likely to escape before they get an arrest warrant. They can frisk mm -hmm. someone who has not been arrested if they have, again, a reasonable suspicion that the person is armed and they can seize a weapon and they can perform a complete search of an arrested person. The most important mm -hmm. thing to, to do, I think, as an employer is make sure your employees know what their rights are Mm -hmm. um, and really the right is they have the right to remain silent and they have the right to request mm -hmm. counsel. I got and you. If so it, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, it sounds to me like whatever your rights are as employees or employers, they're similar. They're the same rights that we have as citizens in the event that a criminal case is being lodged against us. Right. I think that's, that's what that's it sounds absolutely. like. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Now, for us in Chicago and then there are other sanctuary cities and I would assume states, um, does that fact impact the range of responses to ICE when they do the audit or raids or want to detain people, or does that really matter, you know, our sanctuary status? Right. Um when I saw this question, I thought I really hate answering this question. Um, <laughs> it doesn't make it doesn't really make a difference. Basically, wow. what happens is, I mean, the city of Chicago has announced that it is a sanctuary city. What that means is, from the city's perspective, it is not going to automatically comply with a request to turn over information to the Department of Homeland Security or to ICE. It doesn't mm -hmm. restrict ICE or Homeland. Security from doing anything. 
It doesn't wow. give any type of protection like that. In fact, there are people who mm-hmm. think that, and we've seen this a little bit already, where declaring yourself a sanctuary city may actually be a red flag to target the city itself because oh, we saw mm-hmm. that with the issues about federal funding, right? There is this, this issue right. about we're not going to give funding to Chicago because Chicago is a sanctuary city and isn't going to comply with us. Now, that there's litigation on that. Um, I think that organizations that have declared themselves a sanctuary really need to understand that there's nothing legal that that means that, that doesn't mean anything legal. Okay. Now, if you're, so that's if more or less a, a philosophy. Church, yeah, exactly, exactly. And if you're a church or a school or a hospital, those are called, can determined to be sensitive areas. Mm-hmm. And if ICE shows up, you can remind them that you are a sensitive area and they are supposed to kind of, you know, it, it, doesn't, re- it doesn't stop them from coming, but mm-hmm. they're supposed to do a little deeper of an analysis with respect to that. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that, that is very disappointing. It is. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Right, and I know you hate to be the bearer of bad news. Yeah, I mean it sounds good, it feels good, but I think it's really important for people to understand that it doesn't it does not really mean much. Okay. So, what are some of the ways the Community Law Project is helping businesses and organizations be proactive? So. You know, as I said earlier, we don't think it's very likely that most of the nonprofits that we work with, because we work with, you know, fairly small community-based nonprofit organizations, are going okay. to be targeted, targeted. But we do really recommend that despite that, that, that nonprofits take a look at and small businesses take a look at their I-9 compliance and do mm-hmm. a self-audit. Um, if, you have you. Questions, if you have questions, we do have this employer hotline. The next date mm-hmm. is November 13th, and there will be employment attorneys available to answer your questions. You just have to sign up, and you can do that on our website, um, which I think is okay. on the slides that you, you are presenting. We're also mm-hmm. working with a couple of law firms and another organization called the Community Activism Law Alliance to help put together a program so that business owners, not so much nonprofits, but that business owners who are worried about this will put together succession plans for their businesses, um, and mm-hmm. we'll have educational material about that coming up. The Another organization in the city that might be helpful is the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. They are okay. available to answer questions from employers, and their awesome. number is 312-427-0701. And while we're not an organization that does this because we don't directly address immigration issues, we do suggest that if you're concerned for your employees or your clients, that you consider having a Know Your Rights training at your place of business. Mm -hmm. And there are organizations in the city that will come out and do those for you. Okay. And MALDEF is one of them. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so in the unfortunate event that an employee is detained after an I-9 audit or raid, uh, what are some of the strategies that employers can use to help their families cope and to provide support for the workers and their families? And in fact, the employers may need some coping strategies themselves. Right. I think it's really, again, I think this is really important to um, do a Know Your Rights training so people are mm-hmm. aware up front of what their rights are. From the employer perspective, you want to make sure you have emergency contact information for all of your employees. So if someone mm-hmm. is detained, you can notify the family members. Um, you want okay. to offer leave to um, affected workers so they can get their papers in order. You want to pay okay. wages and accrued benefits quickly. And, mm-hmm. you know, if people are not able to return and you can provide severance, you may want to do provide severance to people. But you have okay. to remember that you can't discriminate. So you can't provide severance only for people that have been detained. You have to provide, if somebody leaves your employment, you have to provide severance for anyone who leaves. 
And they can also oh, okay. consider putting together putting together a list of attorneys and or legal services providers to help the employees to be able to identify legal counsel. Mm-hmm. So the National Immigrant Justice Center, the Community Activism Law Alliance, I mean, those are legal services providers who are representing individuals who are mm-hmm. being faced with these issues. And, you know, Chicago has a wealth of legal services organizations, and it might be of benefit for an employer to put that information together for the employees. Yeah, I I definitely, definitely agree. Okay, so we've come to the end of our show, and thank you so much, Jody. This is Jody Atler, everybody. She's the director of the Community Law Project for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, Before we go, Jody, can you share any parting thoughts if you have them? But most importantly, tell us how we can reach you because, as you mentioned from the start, uh, the Community Law Project is really the community's lawyer on a, a very varying amount of well, varying um, spectrum of right. issues. So, right. can you share parting thoughts and let us know how we can reach you? Sure. So, I will I will tell you that there is a lot of information about the work that we do and all the other projects that the Lawyers Committee does on the Chicago Lawyers Committee's website which is mm-hmm. a bunch of letters. So it's, it's C-L-C-C-R-U-L dot org. So it's Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. So C-L-C-C-R-U-L dot org. And our number is, I always forget our number. I'm really embarrassed about this. 312-630-630. <laughs> No, that's not it. I'll give you our number, which is the lawyer, which is the law project, which is three one two nine three nine three six three eight. Um, but I think the takeaway for people is that you just need to be prepared. You know, mm-hmm. take a look at your I nines. You know, if you have things that need to be corrected, you may want to talk to a lawyer or or follow the procedure I talked about about having those par- sections corrected and doing a remedial memo. Um, Make sure your employees and your clients know what their rights are. Make sure you know that they have the right to remain silent. Um, make sure that, you know, your employees know that if there's not a proper subpoena, that they cannot enter private areas of the business. You may want to start, you may mm-hmm. want to mark some areas of your business private so it's clear mm-hmm. where ICE can't go. Um, mm mm-hmm. And make sure you train at least one person in a backup on how to deal with immigration if they come to your place of business. Mm-hmm. You, you know, as you were talking, all I could think about was the fire marshals. Remember, you know, they always like to have a fire marshal <laughs> on every floor or every department. This is what happens when there's a fire. Right. And and one of the things that we didn't talk about, we didn't, I didn't, get to is what happens if they have if they don't have a warrant and they're on a public part of the business mm-hmm. they can if, if it appears that an employee has given them consent to enter further they can use mm-hmm. that consent to enter so that's another reason why you want to make sure your employees know to either say I'm not authorized to talk to you wait I'll get the person who is mm-hmm. or, or not speak at all and make sure that they get that person because you don't want to kind of open the door to letting them wander around. Right. Okay. So thank you so much for that, Jody. Every time I talk to you or any one of your staff members, you know, who are on the show, I always learn a lot and this has been no different. (laughs) Well, thank you. No, thank you very much. Okay. So I want to thank our listening audience today. And um, if you're looking at the episode page, you will see Zodi's picture. You'll see her phone number um, as well. I'm not quite sure which phone number, you know, quite honestly. Um, it's, it's probably for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. But at any rate, there is a phone number where she can be reached. And, um be sure to turn, tune in next week. You know, next week is Veterans Day. I can't believe it. The year just started. 
And we're going to have Dumont Moore. He's the co-founder of the Veteran Strike Force, and he'll be talking about the range of resources that are available to veterans. So until that time, I want you to take care, and, and thank you guys very much, and thank you again, Jody. Thank you, Valerie. All right, take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Get to Old Navy one day only tomorrow. Great gifts like blankets and slippers for the family are just 5 bucks, And Adora boots for women, girls, and toddler girls are just 12 bucks. Tomorrow only at Old Navy. Valid 1214. Select styles in stores only. Get to Old Navy one day only tomorrow. Great gifts like blankets and slippers for the family are just 5 bucks, And Adora boots for women, girls, and toddler girls are just 12 bucks. Tomorrow only at Old Navy. Valid 1214. Select styles in stores only.